Let's bring into the conversation staff writer at The New Yorker, Jelani Cobb. He's the incoming dean of Columbia University's School of Journalism and senior editor at The Dispatch, David French. He is a columnist for The Atlantic. Gentlemen, good morning to you both. I want to read from your respective pieces. Jelani, in your recent op-ed titled The Atrocity of American Gun Culture, you write this, quote, in a single 10-day stretch, 44 people were murdered in mass shootings throughout the country, a carnival of violence that confirmed, among other things, the political cowardice of a large portion of our elected leadership, the thin pretense of our moral credibility, and the sham of public displays of sympathy that translate into no actual changes in our laws, our culture, or our murderous propensities. The circumstances that make a mass murder of fourth graders possible are inherently political. The legal access to the weaponry involved is political. The most visible people refusing to see these things as political happen to be elected to political office. Some of this is on Second Amendment fundamentalists and the politicians who translate their zealotry into law. The rest is on every one of us who has yet to find the courage, the creativity, or the resolve to stop it. A portion of Jelani's piece in The New Yorker. So, uh, Jelani, I'll let you flesh that out a little bit and just add it as some context. The polling that we saw again last week that shows almost nine out of 10 Americans want universal background checks. Even two thirds of Americans in the Politico poll say we should outlaw these semi-automatic semi assault style rifles that are so often used in these mass sh shootings. So when people say this shouldn't be political, you say what? I mean, it's inherently political. There's no way around it. We're looking at the culmination of political decisions. Uh, the reason that the shooter here, that the shooter in Charleston, the shooter in Buffalo, the shooter in, uh, there are too many shootings to actually listen to, to list. But the reason that these people have been able to gain access to these high-powered weapons has been as a result of public policy. Uh, and when we say that people commit explicitly political acts, and the response, as you heard from you know Senator Ted Cruz, you heard from from the mayor of uh, Uvalde, uh, you heard from other people who were on that podium during that first press conference uh, con telling people not to politicize what was happening was uh, an astounding uh, statement uh, of just moral cowardice, in my estimation. And so how do we break through that, Jelani? Let's try to be constructive this morning. I mean, we've got a total disconnect between what it appears the American people want done around the issue of guns and what leaders in Washington are willing to do on guns. How do we change that dynamic? Yeah, I don't know how we change that dynamic. And, you know, that's one of the frustrating things about this, because we have a democracy in which is in which we're supposed to see the will of the public translated into law. Uh, but we've actually seen that stymied by the influence of a small number of people who are lobbyists and uh, politicians who do their bidding and so on. But I have to say one thing, you know, about the background checks and the other uh, kinds of small measures that people are now touting, uh, we're now relieved at the possibility, the frail possibility, of making small changes for gigantic problems. Uh, those things are just not going to save the next fourth grader who's in line of sight of an AR-15. Yeah. David, in one of your recent pieces titled Pass and Enforce Red Flag Laws Now, you write this. When we talk about common gun control proposals after mass shootings, whether we're referring to expanded background checks, assault weapons bans, or limits on magazine capacity, the general rule is that none of those measures, even if implemented, would have actually prevented any recent mass shooting. A well-drafted red flag law should contain abundant procedural safeguards, including imposing a burden of proof on the petitioner, hearing requirements, and a default ex expiration date unless the order is renewed through a clear showing of continued need. I know that red flag laws implicate a core constitutional right. I also know the poorly drafted laws are subject to abuse, but our constitutional structure permits emergency and temporary deprivations of even core liberty interests upon sufficient showing of need with sufficient due process. So, uh, David, you are a supporter of the Second Amendment. You serve in the military. Uh, you understand guns. You understand gun safety very well. What is plausible and what is necessary here? What, what do you see as something on the table? You can take red flag laws, mm -hmm. for example, as getting done here. Yeah, I, and I, I want to say about red flag laws, which are these orders that allow someone, when they've demonstrated they're a, a potential harm to themselves or others, allows the police to go in and literally take the guns from the home and prohibit future gun purchases. The reason why I focus on these is because sadly now we have 50 years of study of mass shootings, 50 years of study of these things. And we know that in most cases, 
to quote from an Institute of Justice funded study, in most cases, the shooters leak their plans before opening fire. And so when we talk about red flag laws, we're talking about laws that are specifically targeted to this phenomenon, to this. And if you look at the shooter in the Uvalde shooting, this is somebody who would have qualified for red flag treatment based on his record prior to the shooting, his conduct prior to the shooting. And we see this time and time again, and it's designed to give law enforcement, to give school officials, an employer and a family, the tools to go in and ask a court to order the seizure of weapons. And this is something that Americans, this is a kind of system that Americans are used to. Think about domestic violence restraining orders, for example, where you could even bar a person from their own family upon showing that they're a danger to their family. And the other thing about this is that they have bipartisan support. This is one of the few measures you're gonna see with bipartisan support. Uh, Marco Rubio, Rick Scott have introduced legislation as recently as last year. Mitt Romney has indicated openness to this. Uh, we've seen Republican, Republican governors sign legislation. This was implemented after the Parkland shooting in Florida. And right now in Florida, there are, more, there are thousands of red flag orders enforced at this very moment. It's a, it's a reform that can concretely move in and save lives. David, Elise Jordan here. Just to follow up a bit, you're a constitutional lawyer. What mm -hmm. could Biden do by executive order to make change in this country? Almost nothing constitutionally. Um, we, what you're talking about when you're talking about um, gun control in this country, you're talking mainly a ma mainly a matter of state statute. And if you're going to go in and you're going to implement any kind of measure that has real national scope or has a national reach, it's going to have to happen through the lawmaking process. Um, that's why I think there is a, a need to focus on an attainable reform that's targeted at the problem that we see. And one of the huge holes we have in our system right now, if you look at mass shootings, the vast majority of mass shooters obtain their weapons legally. The vast majority of mass shooters don't use these assault style weapons. They use handguns, but the majority also broadcast their intentions. We saw this in Parkland, for example. We've seen this time and time again, where these shooters engage in behavior and they radiate menace and threat for a long time. And people just don't have the tools, the legal tools they need to intervene in the same way that they do when people say radiate menace or threat in a domestic, a potential domestic abuse situation. Hey, Jelani, good morning. It's Jonathan Lemire. There's no question in a moment like this, actions mean more than words. We hear that from the victims' families. We hear that from civic groups. We hear that from so many Americans. But words do matter to a point. And what would you like to hear from President Biden, who has in recent days played the role once again of consoler in chief with his trips to Buffalo and Texas. He showed some fire on the issue. He says that change must be done. But what do you want to hear from him? How do you want to hear him frame this issue, this American tragedy with guns? I mean, I think unfortunately we have we could we could publish an anthology of the eulogies presidents have delivered under these circumstances. Uh, one of the things that made people made Joe Biden appeal uh, to many of his voters was the fact that he did uh, broadcast a sense of empathy uh, about his personality and how he he uh, operated as a political office holder. Uh, I think that he's done a good job of framing this conversation and of talking uh, empathetically and. Uh, you know, making the demand and placing the kind of moral onus uh, on the Congress to actually do something. Uh, the problem is how much that translates into actual activity. Uh, and we haven't seen uh, any of the eloquence of any of the presidents who've addressed this issue actually translate into a substantial change in the state of affairs that we're dealing with. Yeah, we're good at national conversations, not so much national action. David, you're also writing about the law enforcement response to the shooting in Uvalde, the criticism police are taking, how long it took them to act. When a man or a woman puts on a uniform and straps on a gun, David writes, whether they're a police officer or a soldier, they should be making a profound declaration. They are willing to die to protect their community and their nation. They don't want to die, of course, but they're willing to pay the last full measure of devotion if that moment arrives. And so at 11.35 a.m., the seven officers present had but one choice, fight to the death to protect and save as many children as they could. They were to emerge from that school with their shield or on it.
There was no other moral choice. But they waited and waited and waited. Two different girls called 911 begging for help. Their classmates were dead and dying all around them. Had the first seven officers pressed in, even as one or more of them fell, we'd still mourn the children who died and we'd still be torn apart by debates over guns. But in our cultural crisis, we'd know a degree of cultural comfort. It is a terrible irony. The police failure in Uvalde occurred less than one week before Memorial Day. I hope we can pause for just a moment on Monday and remember those who did not stand down. Um, I'm remembering now the guidance we saw, David, uh, a few days ago that came out from the state of Texas on school shootings, where it shows the priority of life is of the people inside the building and then yours. And the line after that was, if you're not prepared to do this, perhaps you should choose another career. Yeah, it, the, the details are just stunning. Uh, at 1135, according to the Dallas Morning News timeline, there were seven, seven officers, seven outside the classroom. Two had been grazed by gunfire, very had been lightly wounded, but seven. Uh, and but the, the shooting didn't end for more than an hour, or the incident didn't end for more than an hour after that. It's, it's simply staggering to contemplate. And during that time, at least two different girls made 911 calls from within these classrooms uh, that were besieged by the gunmen. And so I think this is a moment, this isn't just a moment of soul searching when it comes to our ability to enact even a, a single measure, the, these red flags laws that I talked about that are targeted at this problem. It's also a matter I think of soul searching because this is the second school shooting. This isn't the first, this is the second mass school shooting where there were fundamental failures of law enforcement, the good guys on the gun, with the guns on the ground. And